When I first started as an engineer, I had a master's in electrical engineering from Stanford and got my first job and was pretty excited. Um, this was 1975. I was just really excited. And then I had no idea that there would be disparity in salary. So, you know, you don't share your salary, but somehow that gets shared anyway because there are those who like to brag about how well they're doing. And I ended up going to HR because some of the guys were, some of the male engineers were talking about how cool it was to be making over $18,000 a year or $20,000 a year. And I was making $12,300. So I went to HR and I brought the issue up. And they immediately told me that I had a very strong, very high salary for a woman. And I said, well, I know that. I mean, I know I'm a woman, but I'm an engineer. And the person said, no, you're a woman, and this is a very strong salary. And I remember thinking, wow, after all this that I've gone through, all this hard work and getting a great education and trying to increase my opportunities, and I get paid the salary that they say is a good salary for a woman. Um, it was really disappointing, and I, I was discouraged by that. I had no idea that that was going to be an additional burden, if you will, that I'd have to carry, that I was a second citizen in my own career path. My name is Laura Ettinger, and I'm a collector of stories. Stories are incredibly powerful. Stories have incredible power for the people listening to the stories, but they also have incredible power for the people telling the stories. When I hear a great story, I'm walking a mile in someone else's shoes, right? I'm, I'm feeling what they're feeling. I'm coming along their path. I'm empathizing with them. My research is focused on uh, women engineers who graduated from college in the 1970s. These women are at a point in their lives where they're reflecting back on what's changed and what hasn't changed. They came of age when it seemed like, not just seemed like, when things were changing really rapidly. In 1970, the percentage of undergraduate engineering degrees earned by women was less than 1%. By 1979, that had gone up to 9%. So it seemed like it was gonna keep going, 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 going. Up, that's not what happened. Um, leveled off by the mid 80s or so. But by the late 70s, you had a pretty big cohort, a reasonable sized cohort of women who were pursuing engineering. I can tell you that I think that there were some issues, especially in the beginning. Uh, when I started in engineering as an undergrad in 1975, we were still, I mean, there were four women in my mechanical engineering class, at least by the time we finished, um, out of 55 or so graduating engineers. And uh, some professors, quite honestly, I, I'm not sure if they really didn't think we belonged if I would answer a question that, some, that the professor posed, sometimes it would be exactly the same that somebody uh, who was male in my class said later, and he, I was wrong and he was right. And I have to say to this day, I'm not quite sure what that was all about. There's still an assumption that engineers are male, uh, probably because women are still not a predominant group in the field, and especially in mechanical engineering. So my journey as an engineer has, um, it has been enlightening. It's been, um, I've had my highs 
and lows, and there are some challenges in being a female African-American engineer. And I believe that there are biases and unconscious biases. Um, and I believe that you, as a, an individual, need to really be able to detect whether it is conscious or unconscious. However, neither are acceptable. Um, there was an instance when I worked in a major oil company where I was the only female engineer and I was the only African-American engineer. I ended up having lunch with the secretaries, uh, the executive secretaries, um, because I felt like they were receiving me. Um, I, did, I felt excluded. I could have taken the posture of forcing myself and going to sit with them, but that's not comfortable. That wasn't comfortable for me as an engineer. And I think I was only, I was in my late 20s at that time. So, um, you know, that just wasn't comfortable, but I really felt like I was being isolated. When I was in college, um, weird things like my senior year a couple times I would get the highest grade in the class right and so the teacher would start the class off and say okay guys there you go again you let a girl beat you you know and it was like and then you tell my scores and everybody else's scores and it's like that didn't help them like me you know um, the fact that I was a woman coming into a male school and all that legacy didn't help either um, I didn't think about that when I went there. The guys would score when we, the girls went to bring their tables up at the at the cafeteria. The guys would pull cards up and rate you as a ten or a five or a one or whatever. And you know, we just sort of like, Psh, well, we lived through that. So it prepared me well for my career when slights and things like that were happening. I was a line packaging supervisor the first female, degreed female engineer that this uh, Fortune 50 company had ever hired, is what I was told. So they were not expe expecting a female to suddenly show up on the packaging lines. And I had a mechanic on one of the lines who obviously was not very comfortable having me, this young woman around, let alone being his boss. And it really, struck me with one little episode. He was carrying some parts from the packaging lines to the machine shop to do some repair. His hands were full. So I held the door open for him and he stopped. And he said that he was so uncomfortable because he's the one who always holds the door open for the women. That was the first time that it really came home to me that I'm making somebody uncomfortable with my presence here. I didn't think poorly of the man because this was his first experience like this. I felt empathy for him. I felt a little sorry for him, but I couldn't let that bring me down because I knew my own worth. I knew what I was capable of doing. And I just maintained that sense that I know what I'm doing here, others will come to understand it. I was married, my husband worked and I worked. There was a younger engineer, a junior engineer that came in that was under, did not report to me, but he was junior and I was not at the junior level. And there was a time for um, performance raises. I remember um, getting a percentage that was lower than the junior engineer. And I knew my performance was great. I was traveling for the company. Um, I would go do presentations and I was working really hard and I, I felt like I deserved a higher percentage. And he said, well, I need to give the junior engineer a larger increase. I said, is it my performance? I mean, I really need to know was was there a, a lack of performance so I can make that improvement. And he said, no, he has a wife who doesn't work and they have two children. So he needs the money and you don't need the money. And I said, that's not fair. You do not make a determination that I don't need the money. And he said, well, your husband works. We actually did take the company public and they brought in a whole new management team. And the new management team said, 
you can't be a professional woman and work your part-time flexible hours. Uh, so we're demoting you. You're now just going to be a trainer instead of being the director of the technology transfer organization. Wow. It wasn't, I wasn't expected. It was upsetting and it was tough. And, you know, I had to decide what I wanted to do. And what I did was is I decided that I would not be demoted. I would choose to leave, and I did. And I actually chose to take some time between that and the next thing. It was one of the hardest times in my life, but it was one of the best times in my life because it made me step back and see that again. What I had loved so much about that work was helping people be their best. I found out much later that for a long time my salary was, was less than the guys and I didn't get promoted at the same you know rate that guys got and it took me 10 years or more at, at into my career to kind of go oh duh this is what's happening to me uh, because I just sort of just drove through it and figured that, that was what was going to happen. I had a patent that I, that was being um, put through basically when I went on maternity leave, and while I was on maternity leave, they let it get assigned to somebody else and didn't bother to, you know, so they could have actually lost that patent if I'd fought it because I was the inventor. There's still a glass ceiling, there's no doubt. Um, my answer to that was to start my own company almost 30 years ago. So as a consultant, they're paying for expertise, they're paying um, a fair amount of money for expertise. They want the best person they can get. Um, they don't feel generally threatened by a consultant. I'm not in part of their organization. So it was my way of just avoiding dealing with the issue. It, it was an easier solution. I definitely felt, and I think it's even more true today, that there's a lot of expectation, societal expectation, but just embodied expectation as a woman to have a great career, to have, and one that you enjoy, and one that uses your gifts and talents, and one that is financially wonderful, and to have a great family, and to, uh, be a great mom, a great wife, to, but also then have girlfriends. And it's a lot. When I got to Hewlett Packard, I was kind of pushed around. And I really, you know, had to take it. And all the guys said, guys don't work with her. And so eventually, I designed something that's totally crazy today, but it is an auto dialer. And I remember that auto dialer because my role was to transfer data from the facility where I was to a facility on the East Coast. And in those days, what you had to do is call the person up on the phone, and when they picked up the phone, you would have to ask them, would you please put your system in receiver mode? I'm about to go into transmit mode and I'm going to send you one file. And I did this all day. They wouldn't pick up the phone, they weren't answering, but I had to keep redialing and redialing and redialing. And I thought, what a waste of my time. So even though I had this other project, I thought, what if I designed something to automatically redial that number? And eventually they're gonna pick up that phone. And eventually they did pick up that phone. That was it, that auto dialer allowed me to communicate with an engineer who did not want to communicate with me, but also it allowed our technologies to communicate. Well, today, modems, routers, <laughs> any kind of networking interface is basically an auto dialer on steroids. A very successful way I have found of helping other people over their prejudices is by just being who you are and doing a good job. 
working through your actions so that people can understand, oh, this is what a good engineer does. Not this is what a good man or a good woman does. I felt a lot of responsibility being a woman in engineering in the early days. I think a lot of us did, that we had to succeed. There was a lot, there was more pressure on us because we felt responsible. We were the ones that the next generation or the next wave, we were gonna be held up as examples if we succeeded or if we failed. If we succeeded, the way was gonna be easier for the next group that came through. And if we failed, it was going to be harder because we were considered a representative of all women in engineering, which is kind of a scary concept that whether you are doing well on a job is gonna make a difference to that next group coming through, whether they get the opportunity to try. The pressure was about making sure that it was realized by the administration and the managers in the engineering department that we're all equal. If you have an engineering mind, it doesn't come with a W on it for women, or it doesn't come with an M on it for male, or it doesn't come with a letter on it for color. It comes with an opportunity on it, and you can see it when it shows up. And I think it's that whole entitlement that the males were entitled to own the space as an engineer, but I wasn't exactly entitled. I was there kind of renting that space, or I was sort of passing through that space. But I think that the big thing I wanted to do was make sure they understand that I might be passing through after I've been here a few years, but I'm leaving a path for somebody to come behind me. Someone with bigger and better and brighter ideas than I will have. And that somebody is going to be a woman or it's going to be another person of color. If you look at my brain without my face on it and my hair on it and my skin color on it, you're gonna see the mind of an engineer. When you hear someone else's story, when you really hear it, when you really take it inside you, I think it's hard to discriminate against that person or what you perceive to be that group of people. For many women, it can be easy to blame ourselves. Like, if I'm, if I'm not getting ahead in my career, or I feel like I'm in a meeting and my voice isn't heard, or, or I feel like, oh my gosh, I have a three-year-old and I'm trying to have this career and I feel like I'm losing my mind. Why is it I feel like I'm losing my mind? It can be easy to say, oh, I don't have my act together enough. Like, it must be me. It seems like everyone else around me seems to have this figured out. It must be me. I would suggest, no. <laughs> I would suggest that there are systemic problems out there. And, and I think that's the part of the power of hearing these stories, is that it's a reminder, it's not just me. I'm not alone, right? There are these bigger, um, bigger problems, bigger issues out there. I'm part of a community of people who are facing these issues as well. And th again, that makes me feel a little less alone. Mm -hmm.